Welcome in, everyone, to a Labor Day edition of the Flow Track Podcast. I am Kevin. Pleased to be joined by my co-host Gordon Mack. Colt is producing. He didn't. He didn't want days off. Gordon didn't want a day off. Colt didn't want a day no. off. So like, let's no, no. let's do the pod on Monday. There's too much to talk about. So here we are. Good morning. It's good to see you, Kevin, on this glorious Labor Day. What'd you do this weekend? Did you do a uh, any Labor Day weekend activities? Took the kids to a bike slash skate park in our neighborhood that was new. Kind of interesting dynamic. It was about 50% kids with their parents trying to teach them to go around this little course. And then the other half was somewhat serious BMX slash scooter slash skateboarders who just wanted to rip it and get big air. And watching those two groups interact with each other on a Sunday morning was, was pretty fun. Um, and then the afternoon, bad allergy attack for me. I got hit. I don't know if you had that out here, but I, I was in a, in a puddle, basically. Itchy eyes, throat scratchy, all that bad stuff. So I feel better today, though. Woke up, went for a run. So hopefully the Monday of Labor Day will be better. I'm trying to, you know, we're doing guess my PR. I want to do guess yeah. my co-host's uh, hobby when he was a kid competition. Were you a mm. biker? A skateboarder or a scooter player? Don't tell me. I'll try to guess. I think you were, you definitely were a biker. You didn't skate or scoot. Were you a biker? 100%. 100%. Scooters weren't that big. Like Razor scooters didn't become that big until I was a teenager, late teen years. And there's no way I could pull off a skateboard. I mean, you've seen me. Walking sometimes is difficult for me on the coordination side of things. I remember I tried to ollie in my best friend's garage one time when I was in fifth grade and I ended up on my tailbone and that ended my skateboarding career. But you, you seem like a man of many talents though. I feel like you, you, were you a triple threat kid? I, I did do all three, but they were all in phases. Started with biking and then I Mm -hmm. realized, Ooh, all my friends skateboard. So I want to skateboard, Uh. but didn't have a skateboard. So I got a scooter and I was that one friend. I was the one scooter rider when everyone else was skateboarding <laughs> and I looked like a, yeah. the biggest doofus ever. Cause I would try to like do the cool tricks. And I was like, I get handlebars and these guys are doing it with just their feet. Um, so I felt stupid and I would fall. It, it's one thing like falling in front of your friends. It's another falling on a scooter in front of your skateboard friends. Like that's like a different yeah, yeah. level of embarrassment because it's like, dude, you had handlebars and you still couldn't land the trick. Um, there, then I got skateboard. It, Late. So there was this, there was a couple guys on the the scooter, regular scooters, who were just flying in the air. I've never seen people on scooters get so high up in the air as these guys were going over these little these little bumps. It was it was pretty impressive. Also, none of the grown ups, none of the older people doing all these crazy tricks, not one wearing a helmet. It's just a great example. One hundred percent helmet compliance for the kids. Zero percent for all the adults that the kids were looking up to because they were doing sweet tricks. It was just, you could see, you could see where that was headed in a couple of years. You know, why don't we have uh, any more professional pole vaulters with helmets? It used to be a thing. That was a thing for a while, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. That's a good, that's a good question. It, it definitely, I remember going to height. Was it, I just remember going to high school meets and I haven't been to a high school meet in a bit. So maybe high schoolers are still doing it, but the pros maybe. just are worried. They don't know how to do it. Uh, yeah. I remember seeing a couple pros at the time doing it and, uh, but I don't remember, I don't remember in this era seeing any, any helmets out there. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, it would be cool. Man, if it was start wearing a helmet. it will be fun. Yeah. Might make it more fair. Like just like, like a weighted helmet. Like yeah. he just has to add more, more weight to him. Um, medicine ball any event yeah exactly so uh, our email address flowtrackpodcast at gmail.com flowtrackpodcast at gmail.com uh what were your thoughts this berlin continental tour meet you went through you you watched all the good stuff here we could say this is what the penultimate big meet of 2022 because we got uh, zurich coming up in the diamond league final but what were your thoughts on on berlin yeah, I mean, I was excited for a few races. Uh, I guess starting with Noah Lyles in the 100, going against a good competitor in Omanyala. And he straight up just dominates 
the field. The time isn't something too crazy, 9.95. He's, he's clearly can run faster than that, but it's still a respectable time compared to what the other people in that field are running. I mean, Omanyala ran 10.11, so that separation mm -hmm. was, was real. And, you know, I think it shows that Lyles, you know, continues to be in his best form of his career. But my one question is, can mm -hmm. Lyles master the 100? Can mm -hmm. he? We know he's mastering the 200. He just broke the American record, the 200. I think he's going to run similar 200-meter times for the next two, or two years, like flirting with a 19.3, flirting with a 19.2. I won't say it, but maybe going all the way to the 19 ones. I don't know. But we know he has that ability because he's, he's shown – He's created a new floor in his, like, running 19.6 as his new floor. But we don't know if he can be an elite 100-meter runner. Yeah. He kind of gave a little bit of that when he was running some 19.8s against Coleman a few years ago. But, I mean, look at his 100-meter results. 10.42, 10.39. Again, those are headwinds. 10.05, 9.90 yep. with a big tailwind. 10.05 at pre. And then 9.95. Like, you look at those results. That does not look like the results of a 19-3 200 meter runner. It looks like the results of like a pretty good college kid. Yeah, but then you go back, and he has run 986 before. He does have some big wins. I think we're into 2019 Lyles again, aren't we? Post Doha, you know, he dominates that whole season, and then the question is, can he do the double in 2020? at the Olympics. Obviously that gets delayed a year. Then we go to the trials and he struggled early season in the hundred quite a bit. 200. He had, you know, much better showings, although he wasn't like dominant Lyles early on. Doesn't make the team in the hundred then medals in the 200 doesn't win in the 200. And then everybody thinks, and I think him himself included in this. All right, let's just focus on one. Let's just focus on the 200. I got to get the 200 back. Well, now in the course of a year, it seems like he's completely reasserted control of the 200. He has. And any doubts about that have been assuaged. So then the question then pops up again. Okay, well, if he has to challenge himself, what's he going to challenge himself? He's not running the 400, so it's got to be the, the 100, the 100, 200 double. The, the, the situation is, is pretty similar, though, right? It's the back half is there. You can see it in this Berlin race. Looked terrific on the back half. You know, can he stay close enough on the front end? To, to be competitive. And I know he said he worked a lot on his start. His 60 was getting better as well, too. But Curly, Rommel, Coleman all have the same PB, right? They're all high 9.7 guys. Lyles at his best, 9.86. He's got to find another 10th in there to be a lot to find. A tenth. competitive. It is. It is. But I think if you're talking about a 19.31 guy, he can do it. He can do it. It's possible. Question of will he do it and, and does he want to do it? But he's in a spot that he's been in before in his career. And I'm interested to see how he'll play that. Because it's not very common when you get basically a chance to redo an exact scenario from three years, four years prior. And that's where he finds himself again. He's better in the two than now than he was in 2019. But I'd argue the competition also is better in the two now than it was in 2019. So we have similar types of gaps between him and the rest of the world in the two. And then the 100, that's pretty similar too, right? App coming off 2019, who you had Coleman there running high 9.7s. Now you have yeah. Fred Curley right. running high 9.7s. It's, it's sort of deja vu all over again for Lyles. And I would, I'm very interested to see what he does. The one difference is you're going into a world championship year and not an Olympic year. And maybe that does make a little bit of difference, but what, what do you think, what do you think he will do? And what do you think he should do? I think he should attempt to uh, improve his hundred because I think it's only going to help his 200. I don't think What's that he mean is... though? attempt to improve. Of course he wants to attempt to improve. Do you mean, like he'll he'll have the buy. Yeah, I think focus on it. Try to hey, Big prioritize. 100. I want to win. I want to win. 
go into 2023 and be like, I want to win the 100. At USA's? No, at Worlds. Okay. Like that should be his mindset. He's going, I want to win the 100 and the 200. But he's got to say the word 100 first. Because <laughs> you can't just say, I'm going to win the 200 and the 100. No, you got to win the 100 and then end the 200. Because he can afford to put the 200 as a secondary priority because he's that good that a secondary priority of a 200 will still result in a win. Yeah. But I think he needs to just go into 2020 and be like, I want to win the 100. The same way Fred Curley was like, I'm going to win the Olympic title in the 100. Came up yeah. a medal short, and then a year later, he wins it. He, was just fo- so he wasn't saying, like thinking, he's got to go all in. So you're saying he can prioritize the 100 and still win the two? Yes. It's just tough to do that, though. His Knighton is still young, and Knighton has the 49 to his name. <laughs> and it's just tough to be like, all right, got this thing on lock. But hey, maybe he's also at the point of his career where he is willing to take that risk. Okay, if I go for both, and, I, and it ends up not working out, and I end up costing myself something in the two, that's fine. I can always reassess for 2024. But for the World Championships, maybe I'll give it a shot and see if I can get both of these. Because as he looks right now, I mean, what was this? This was a 9 9. But you, you, yeah, you talk about the margin, though, between him and Omanyala. That's a solid margin. Like right now, where would you have him in the U.S.? 100 rankings. Curly, Bracey, Bromel, and then it would probably be he'd be in that next group, right? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I'm not allowed to do these tiers. Remember last time I made tiers, people, all the Christian Coleman stands got mad. Um, <laughs> You don't need yeah, to do tears. I mean, I'm just saying, if they ran the 100 U.S. champs right now, if the U.S. championships were, and they're all healthy, just assume they're all healthy. Okay. Like, does he get top three? Is he four to six? Is he seven to nine? Like, where is he in that? Four group? to six. Yeah. He's, no, he's okay. like five to six. He's five to six. Yeah. So he needs to take another step up from where he's at right now, but yeah. I certainly think that's possible. There's no reason... You know, you're running 19-3. I think there's more time there. It's just a matter of that the first part of that that race. But again, maybe he just has bad memories of 2020, the beginning of 2020, and when he was running a lot of hundreds and it didn't work, and then the the 200 went off track as well too. But I think it's one of the stories to watch in next season because he does have the buy. And because it is strange that he's finding himself right, all that stuff happened, and he finds himself right back to where he was at the beginning of 2020, end of 2019. Side note, uh, Colt has this YouTube feed up, and if you look at the likes and dislikes ratio, yeah, Colt is able to see dislikes on YouTube. How is that possible? I have an extension. Dislikes. Yeah. You have an extension? Yeah. That tells us how many dislikes. Well, this has a pretty good ratio. 4.4 thousand likes to only 11 dislikes. Who do you think the 11 people who disliked this Noah Lyles 100-meter yeah. dash? That's a, strange, that's a strange group of 11 people. Maybe they wanted to see him run faster. It's like, no, I'm only clicking on 9.8s on YouTube. So they were elitists? Or were they big, like, Omen Yala fans and didn't want to yeah. see their boy getting beat? They're <laughs> just like, listen... Listen, I'm gonna watch this video, but I'm gonna hit the thumbs down on it. I don't know, but that's a good. That is a good ratio, though. Forty four hundred to eleven, that's pretty solid. If you go through mm-hmm. life, and for every eleven people who dislike something you do, four thousand four hundred like it. It's pretty good. Pretty good. I'll take that. I'll take that. Yeah. Approval mm-hmm. rating high for Noah Lyles. <laughs> going into it's an going election up. year, it's great. Thumbs up. up. Thumbs up, Noah Lyles. All right, what's next? Oh, Warhol. I mean, 47-24. Yeah, 47-2. We knew he was going to win. Man, when I was watching this race, that first, like, 150, I was like, oh, boy, are we seeing something special? Because um, mm-hmm. he was out like a bat out of hell. He was already making up staggers. Like, you could see him going over one hurdle and then – you count to like two, and then you see the next guy's going over there hurdle. It was insane. Um, 
And then he kind of slowed down in the final 100, which makes sense. He's not in his 45-second form. I don't, it's going to be hard to replicate that. But he looks good. He looks healthy. I mean, I, look, I, would, I wanted to see him race Dos Santos. He could have raced him. Like, they, Dos Santos ran a few days ago, and then Warholm runs at Berlin. And now they're not running. There's something about what the Norway elite athletes not racing the other guy that we <laughs> want to see him run. Like, we're not seeing Jakob versus Jake Whiteman. We're not seeing yeah. Warholm versus Dos Santos. Um, kind of a bummer, but, you know, I was hoping that he would throw down, like, a 46 low to, like, get us excited. But 47 low. You know, easy day at the office yeah. for Carson Wilhelm. He was super pumped too. He was, he was screaming. He was pumped. High five in the when mascot, giving a bear hug. Yeah. That's that's how he looks at breakfast. Wild. I think too. I think that's Carson Wilhelm's always set to that level. He so, he how always knocks you? someone out. Watch he throws the watch this. He like knocks someone in the head. Boom. Oh, and he's like oh oops, oops. <laughs> uh, my bad. <laughs> hey, the guy got it right on. Um, I'm with you. First 200 looked real strong. I mean, second half looked great too, but I think that's just, he doesn't have a ton of races under him. And when he's doing the rehab, he's just missing a little bit of fitness. But I would have liked to seen Dos Santos in there just as a marker because you have seemingly Warholm on the way up because he's gaining fitness. Dos Santos probably on the way down because he's the gold medalist. He's chilling. He's just making sure he gets these races in. So it would have been interesting to see them cross paths and what that would have looked like. But all in all, this just sets it up for 2023. Uh, it's too bad we can't see it at Brussels or sorry, in Zurich. Again, if I was in charge, they would be running against each other. Yaka could be running against Jake, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I, I've talked about that before when he crossed the finish line and those flames shoot up. It just, where are you at on the flames shooting up as people cross the finish line? You pro or con? I mean, it's, I'm indifferent. It is interesting because they go up before they cross the finish line. So it can be a little yeah. distracting, especially if you're in lane one. You're like, bro, I might get yeah. knocked off by these flames. But yeah, I wonder if it affects like the wind gauge for like the 100 <laughs> maybe. I don't know. Just interesting. I mean, they, it seems like a lot could go wrong there. Yeah. It's like reminds me of a photographer you know, could just the... get caught in fire. Yeah. You turn the. You remember, you, like you're at home, you turn the stove on, you hear it tick, 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 or the grill for a while, and you're like, "Why is this thing not going on?" Then boom, all of a sudden, that's kind of you know got the gets the hair off your knuckles. But good win for Warholm. Uh, good use of fire at the end there. Uh, Berlino, man, Berlino. Has anybody had a longer run in track than Berlino? Like, is that the mascot stays. from 2009? Yeah, and he's his contract gets renewed every year. It'd be like, it'd be like the one from. World Championships and Eugene, legend, coming back from pre every year. Maybe he Maybe will. that's the plan. Maybe that – Maybe hmm, – ri Rivalry yeah. between Berlino and legend? I can see that. It, Maybe they thought about that. 100-meter dash? The, you know, the legend of Prefontaine, the legend, like that's why they were doing it, to kind of give him a, a full 10-year contract instead of just a one-week contract. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Mascot that's race. Uh, I'd be down. Yes, 100%. Well, we need Warholm and Berlino to come to pre. We need both of them to come to pre. Yes. It's not a, a singular deal. It's both of them. It's a package. I was really wrong about Legend. Like your bolt take was worse, obviously, than, than my Legend take. But I was anti-Legend early on. Um, and I was – the moment he started having the dance-off with Allison Dos Santos – I just realized how how bad I was, uh, how off I was, because I legend really proved something to me over those those ten days. Again, I think it's kind of scary uh, that to me, like let's show, let's show this picture up here if you're watching. That's just nightmare fuel right there. I'm still terrified by the eyes. However, the dance, the ability um, to pull off successful dance moves, to do comedy bits, you know, walked right next to Sydney after shit the world record and said, "What I." I eat world records for breakfast or something like that. It's fun, like good comedic timing. And it had legend actually had some good physical skills, like some tumbling and some dancing that was able to enhance the meat. I thought. Yeah. We'll turn this into a 
mascot breakdown podcast. That's what the true fans want on a. Did you like Legend? September Legend 5th. versus Dos Santos is pretty good. That dance off was no, pretty it was good. good. Yeah, like I was impressed with. I was watching like they had like comedic bits for like the 10k. You had a bunch of yeah. signs for like every lap. Like they definitely thought everything through. It wasn't just show up and clap your hands and get people excited. Like yeah. they were being very <laughs> intentional with their their bits. The only hard thing about it is that it's hard for a mascot to like have an impact in an open door stadium because yeah. mascots have more control. Mascots work better in like NBA arenas because it's mm-hmm. louder. They can like do things more specific and it's like, I don't know. I feel like mascots can't really and get fall a for the giant roof. Cra- yeah. Fall for the roof. Can't do like an NBA dunk contest type thing. Yeah. I don't know. I just feel like mascots work better in closed arenas. Some of them are just costumes and that's it though. And they don't really have anything else. So the fact that yeah. Legend could dance, I thought was big. Because some of those ones out there, you're right. They just kind of run around and try to do pranks and throw popcorn at people and that's it. But this, 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 this mascot had another gear was able to go to. So, all right. Check you know me on the, the best chat. Mascot of all time was? Huh? Big shot from the Sixers back in the nineties. I knew it was going to be a Sixers one. Of course. Uh, Dustin says Warhol and Muhammad look similar recently in their strong starts, but difficulty maintaining through the second half, both coming back from injury. Just too many parallels in the men's and women's foreign hurdles. Said he's a big fan of the flames. They should light them up for the last lap though, and do fireworks as they come across the line. Uh, Tampico says foreign hurdles is a done deal. Bowl two, Delilah three. Nobody is catching Sid. Hard to argue. Hard to argue that pecking order. Do we have a picture of this is Big Shot, the mascot? Let's throw Big Shot up here. Look at Big Shot. This was OG best Philadelphia mascot. <laughs> Better than a Philly fanatic. <laughs> he knew how to get things done. All right. Didn't know Other he had results. Like, Tidy Whitey's on his. That's kind of wild <laughs> outfit. Amusan, 1245. Um, men's high hurdles, though. Holloway hangs on. This is this, it was the same race again. Let's, let's throw this up there. Grant Holloway gets the win, 1305. Um, but the last two hurdles, his lead just erases, and he almost gets caught by is it Crittenden at the line. Yeah, I mean, something. We keep talking about this is Holloway's weakness. The final two hurdles, people close on him. He is so good. He's able to get a big lead, but he just falls apart in the final 20 meters. And it's so hard to figure out why. He definitely knows he needs to work on that part of his game. But, like, what is, what is it? I can't figure it out. Yeah. It seems too good to have that big of a weakness. He's had – I mean, guys – it's happened before, right? This is this has been a this has been an issue before, and I guess if anybody is going to have a weakness, everybody's going to have a weakness. That just just his is just more apparent because it comes when he already has. He's so good at the first eight hurdles that it makes the last two hurdles look slower. But what Critton did did is similar to what Broadbell did, similar to what Trey Cunningham did which is use those last two hurdles. I mean, look how quick he is getting off the line. I mean, the, the, the gap he has by hurdle two, by hurdle one, really, you're not supposed to separate that much the first two hurdles. But then it all, like, he just starts to slow off those last two. And, I mean, he narrowly, narrowly won this thing. They, shout out to Crittenden, though. Ran well at Nakak. Now a lot of people, people are paying attention to Nakak. Um, and now comes to a bigger stage and uh, almost beats the world champion. Yeah. I was, I was going to say so. Well, I mean, it's not, it's okay. So who do you think like flat sprint speed, you take grant, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it, I think it's more just a momentum issue coming off those last, those last two. Cause you'd think, cause Devin Allen's really good. And the final hurdle in, he always has that little boost, and you can count on him to edge somebody or hold the rest of the field off if he's in front. 
Grant, theoretically, in the 100, I mean, we saw him in the flat 60, what he did in college. Like, he's got top-end speed to burn. So I, I just think it's a, his rhythm just gets thrown off, and he's not able to utilize that speed because that should be a strength of his race, the final 10 meters. Do you think there's a, a chance that his, like, he runs out of real estate for his stride length. That like his stride pattern works he's coming up on the hurdles well for the first seventy percent of the race, but then when he's at his top speed, he has to like kind of pull back a little bit, or else he'll hit the hurdle because he's just going too fast. Like, is there yeah. a chance he's going too fast near the end that he would needs to slow up, or else he'll hit the hurdle? But he's figured it out before because he's run faster than this. Yeah. He's almost broken the world record. It's just the timing. Yeah, I've heard that before. People just coming up on the hurdles too much. Again, I just, it's been the same issue now for the last several races. He's good enough to where he can win with this happening. But then the alternate, if it goes in the other direction of he has a great set of hurdles all the way through and that's when you say okay this is a world record guy because look again that margin off the first two and it happens every single time it's not oh he lucked out got a crazy good start every single time he's able to do this off the first two hurdles i mean it's just it's uncanny his ability to just explode out of the blocks and get into his running i mean he's down and out there it's it's tougher to see from the head-on angle but when they did the side angle and it was just a, it was a very noticeable lead through two hurdles. And then really, I mean, I was saying eight and, or nine and 10. It's really like 10. It's really coming off of 10. Now, I think he starts to slow on nine, but really where you see it is the final 10 meters off that last hurdle. Yeah. Well, we'll see him in the Diamond League final. He'll be there. Did you see that the, uh, Put out their full Diamond League start lists. I did. Anything stand out to you? Um, they had nine. Uh, Shakari Richardson got into the the women's hundred. Mm -hmm. so that was interesting. Um, there was no Marvin someone, Bracey in the men's hundred. Did someone scratch Just, the women's hundred? No, it I, maybe. Oh, uh, Elaine Thompson Hara scratched. Gotcha. Um. I mean, we'll there go through more of it on, in there. on yeah, Wednesday. There and there's nine women. Yeah. Five Ks have Alicia Monson and Grant Fisher in it. with A bunch of Ethiopians and Kenyans. Um, yeah. I mean, we kind of knew what we were going to see. We know we're not going to see matchups we wanted. Obviously, we know there's no Sydney. There's no Fred Curley. There's no Michael Norman. There's no a bunch of guys. And Andre de Grasse is still there. We thought he would scratch, but he's actually running. Um, so... We'll talk more about that on Wednesday, though. Yeah. I'm looking at uh, men's four hurdles. Dos Santos yeah, is there's no there. more. I like, I like how they do this. It's pretty much just like women's event, men's event, women of the same discipline. It reminds me of high school or college. Just like yeah. women's 100, then the men's 100. Just like not this complex schedule where you got to sort through it all. Um, yeah. So nine in. Nine in the final there for the for the hundred. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, Jackson is doubling. Props to her. Go for Don't it. see a lot of doublers out there. Yeah, go for it. Gabby Thomas I, is in the women's two hundred. She came back. Oh, that'll that'll be cool. Is um, yeah. let's see who else is women's two. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I thought Jackson was an important person because. The potential for the U.S. to win one of those and get a, a buy would be huge. But Jackson is going to be the one of the people standing in the way. Obviously, Fraser Price, too. But I'm interested to see just how Fraser Price looks after what happened in, uh, what happened in Brussels. Um, all right. One interesting result, I thought, non-Berlin in Padua, the men's 1500. Gerrit Nagus is quietly piling up an impressive late summer season. You're in 333. Um, that comes after running a 336 and winning in Luzerne 
and then he won in Memphis running 334.95. So he's got three pretty solid times, but more importantly, three wins. Um, in this race, Cole Hawker as well. So some big name United States competition with them as well too. Have you been have you been keeping tabs on Nagoose? Yeah, I've been seeing it. He's been impressing. Um trying to figure out where that time ranks all time in US history. 33326. You know? So I'm doing the math right now. Got to remove a bunch of people who've ran. Like Leo Manzano only ran that fast three times. Lopez mm-hmm. Lemong only did it twice. Centro only did it one, two, three, four, five, seven times. That's actually pretty good. But like, I can, I can, I can name some people if you want. Do you want me to name some people? Lagat. I, I have, I have the list of who has run faster than that. Sydney so Marie. This, can you? Oh, can you? All right, let's see. If, oh, the game. Can you name? Uh, everyone that's run faster than that. Okay. U.S. U.S. athletes. Well, I cheated because I, I looked at the first couple, but I would have known those okay. ones. Can you tell me how many yeah. there are? Can you tell there me how many are there are? Fifteen. Wow, that's a lot. So it's the sixteenth um, fastest time. Okay, here we go. Ready? Yeah. Lagat. Correct. He's number one. Marie. Sydney Marie. Correct. Number two. Matthew Centrowitz. He's number three. Look, you're going in order. This is great. Alan Webb. He's number four. Andrew Weeding. He's number five. You're not cheating, are you? No. Well, on the first three, I was, but those last two, I wasn't. I remember Weeding. Yeah, I'm all in order. At that time. I'm on, yeah, now I'm going to be out of order. Um, let's go. Let's go. Well, Manzano. He's number six. 3.30.98. Let's go Craig Engels. No. No? Oh, nope. darn it. Okay. You get three um, wrong answers, and then the game's geez. over. Okay. You get three strikes. All right, I'm at strike one. How many, how many do I have left? I've done six. You, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine guys left. Holy moly. <laughs> um, Some big names. Steve Scott. Steve Scott is one. Yes. Okay. Um, you ran three thirty one back in nineteen eighty five. Cole Hawker. Yes. Good. Ran three thirty one at the Olympics. I don't remember if Cooper because Cooper Tier ran all his fast miles, so I'm going to leave Cooper Tier off for a second. And this is outdoor uh, only. Yeah. Okay. Um. Geez, not Steve Holman. Gabe Jennings didn't run that fast, did he? Um, no. I'm choking here. Stember didn't run that fast. Some Stuff. names are recent. Some like some of them. Two of them are still running today. Josh Thompson. No. Dang it. Uh, Lopez. Yes. Okay. Um, Same team. Yeah. So not Centro. Not. Thompson. Who else is on Bowerman? Brandon in 2015. Who else is on Bowerman? I'm blanking. Go ahead. Evan Jager. Oh, at Portland Track Festival. Yep. All right. Okay, so there. So Jim Spivey ran 331. Spivey. Spivey. Yeah, that one. Scar- par- apologies. Steve Holman ran 331. I said Holman. Dang it. I know. 331. David Crum. Menecker, Krummenacker. David Krummenacker. Should have guessed this guy. These guys. Jim Ryan, three thirty-three ten. That's that was embarrassing. A big one. Should have the Jim yeah. Ryan one. And then last, uh, rest in peace, David Torrance, when he was a U.S. citizen, okay. ran three thirty-three twenty-three in Italy. All right, I really should have gotten obviously Jim Ryan, but Spivey, Krummenacker, Holman. Those are guys of eras that i'm aware of I, yeah that's yeah it it, it kind of used to be like if you're the best of your era you've run around that time yeah and now it's a bunch of guys have run that time yeah. so now yard and the goose right. is number 16 on that list not great performance in trivia or <laughs> number 16 
is he the number one seed for the U.S. going in? If you had any rankings for 2023? In the 1500? Yeah. I, yeah, I can't. I guess so. I mean, it should be it should be Hawker, but Hawker is getting straight up beat by Nagus here, and so yep. I can't just be like, "Well, twenty twenty one Hawker is going to show up." Yeah, but I think yeah, you got it. I think Nagus might be. It's weird to say, but I think Nagus is the number one seed. Yes, I think if I had to do a power ranking, I mean, I would say Cooper Tier, but he's coming off injury too now. So I think Nagus. Maybe Tier Hawker would be my order. No, and then maybe Thompson and Davis. Centro, I don't mm. even know. Like it's just like unknowns with Centro with the injury, Cooper Tier with his injury, Cole Hawker yeah. with him coming back from whatever he's dealing with. There's just yeah, and even you know Yarna Goose. He's great, and he's run some great time trial times and. He did well at the Olympic trials, but like he also didn't run well at USA's. So yeah, it's like no one is a lock, lock, lock the way Centra was, the way Leo Manzano was. Like we had a long yeah. era where there was always one guy who you knew no matter what is making the team, and that was Centro, and that was Leo, Leo first, and then Centro. I feel like we don't have that anymore. Like we thought maybe Cole Hawker would become that guy, but that's Clearly not true, and so it makes the fifteen hundred yeah. exciting because there's always going to be three spots available, not two, the way it had been for you know the previous fifteen years. Another athlete, American athlete, that's been crushing it late season under the radar, Allie Wilson, in the women's eight, she won in Padova one fifty eight thirty seven. This is her post. USA's in the 800. Gordon. She had 159 in Chorzow, got fifth. Second at Nakak to Ajay Wilson, 158.4. Second in Lausanne, 158.09. One in Rovereto, 158. And then one in Padova, 158. So she's run 158 four times and gotten second or first in her last four races against. You know, solid competition. Like, she's winning the races that you'd need to win. Like, this one, she beat Gemma Riki. And when she's losing, she's losing to very good people. So, I know that 800 team is going to be so hard to make next year. But Thing Mo made it a bit easier by getting the bye. I think Allie Wilson is the best candidate right now to take advantage of the U.S. having that fourth spot. Yeah, I can see that. Um yeah, it would, it's also fun to have two A. Wilsons on the track at the same time. And you're like, oh, Ajay yeah. and Ali Wilson. Yeah, but yeah, 158, that's, that's showing consistency. It shows that the 158 isn't a flash in the pan. It shows that you can rely on that. You can do it, you know, through the rounds. Because everyone has a fun, fast PB, but no one, it's hard to have the consistent time. And 158 is your baseline. That sets you up well for a three-round race. At USA's in the 800. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and I, like I said, the, the quality of people she's running against is good. like she lo lost to Lamont in Lausanne, but Lamont ran 157.8 in that race. And Wilson beat Ricky again there. She beat Nikai. She beat Sinclair Johnson in that race. So she's racking up wins against good people late in the season. And, um, that big three for the U.S. is so good that it's hard to see someone breaking into it. And they're also just very reliable. Like Raven Rogers, you're never going to pick against Raven Rogers when it comes to making a U.S. team. Never going to pick against Ajay Wilson. Obviously, a thing Mo is, is a, now a two-time gold medalist in the 800. Um, so it's hard to imagine. But you get that fourth spot, you don't need to worry about beating any of those people. You just got to yeah. get – you just got to – you know, a thing Mo and two other people can beat you. And you're, and you're and you're fine. You're on the U.S. team. So look out, Allie Wilson, next year. Anything else? See, I'm checking in with the chat here. See if anything else is going on over there. 
Uh, yeah, so we'll do the live show on Friday after Zurich. Same no, time, right? Thursday. 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 That's right. Sorry. We're doing Wednesday, Thursday. Wednesday, we're going to preview Diamond League final um, mm-hmm. and anything else that's happening around the world. Maybe talk a little about cross country. I wanted to talk about cross country today. Can we talk a little bit about cross country? You have five minutes to talk about cross country. Go ahead. Because we're, we're not going right. to do it on Wednesday. But. Cool. Go, go to the Flow Tracks uh, Twitter and bring up the latest NAU tweet. Oh, um, this is hilarious. So, <laughs> it's not hilarious. So yeah, it's, this past this is, weekend this was the opening race that a lot of people run time trials or whatever. And uh, NAU has this meet called uh, the George Kite Classic, which is in Buffalo Park. 7,000 feet altitude, four and a half miles. And this meet has been run for many years. Over the years, I've been able to tabulate the fastest times ever run on this course. And this past weekend, four NAU guys ran four of the the fastest 20 times. Number two, four, 12, and 19 all time in course history, which shows they got depth because they did had four guys run that. They didn't run George Kush or Colin Solomon in the race, which adds another two guys. And right behind Brody Hasey was Theo Quox by like a second. So they have a good group of seven runners right now. And it looks like they, you know, are going to once again be the hardest team to beat in November. Just, it just never ends. They continue to reload. They lost Abdi Hamid Nur, but, you know, Drew Bosley's out here running. 2209 over four and a half miles at 7,000 feet. Nico Young ran well. Raf. Raf is the GOAT. He has the number one time from sophomore mm-hmm. year. He now has the number 12 time from senior year. And he has the number 18 time from junior year. So Raf that's is how the you know. GOAT yeah, that's course. how you know it's a legit. It's I was kind of like, hey, is this stat legit? But then I remembered that sophomore Ryan Raf is the greatest <laughs> runner in NAU history. And I was like, all right, I'm glad Gordon keeps posting times from this meet because it really is okay, well, where they're at. So, but hear me out. If you, you look at, questions. if you look at find, th- top find 13 someone to times. care about you the same way Gordon cares about the George Kite classic people. If, look at the top 13 times. Everyone who's I finished to the top, the top 13. Times. No, top 13. We're looking at top 13. Top 13. Everyone on that list in the top 13, that race at NCAAs that year, finished All-American. Mm-hmm. Because Ryan Raff, remember, well, the year he ran definitely not. the fastest time, did not start in 2019, which is a big reason yeah. maybe why they lost that meet. Because maybe Ryan Raff so he, won the, the NCAAs. So the fastest time on, in the course history came from a guy who didn't make the top seven. And yeah. you're holding this up as, okay. Everybody knows times in cross country, especially early season college cross country meets, really a good barometer of where a team's at. Okay, how about this? I'm not no, as confident simpl- in you. I'll this simplify year. to that. They had seven guys run faster than what George Kush cr- ran on this course last year. And it doesn't matter though. Just it doesn't. They're just most of the time they're jogging. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. It's the early season. They don't. You don't know what the weather was. You don't know what the directions were. Their coach told them. The to directions run. was it going the wrong way. The course. They were like no directions right from the coach. Of from the coach, how hard to run? You think Grijalva? I mean, by this estimate, Grijalva is twenty two oh six, twenty two twenty six. That puts him uh, over at fourteen. Yeah, I mean, he's way behind Ryan Raff, which is which is crazy. <laughs> I'm not that confident about NAU. I got to be honest this really? year. Who are you confident? Yeah. In? Well, nobody, and that's the problem. Well, not that not that's not a problem for NAU, but that's a problem for everybody else. But. I'm not as, okay, this is a done deal as I was last year, looking at their roster. I don't know. This result made me think it's a done deal. Because you're relying a lot on, we're going full circle here, relying a lot on a true freshman to be in your top five. You're relying a lot on someone like Kusha to be in your top five, who's more of a a shorter distance guy. Um, All these, he's run fast 5,000s too, but... It's just not the, it's not the team of last year where you could hang your hat on a Grijalva, could hang your hat on a, a Yabdi Hamid Nur. Um, but the issue is, like Stanford, you have them getting three in the top four, but then their fourth guy is like 55th or something like that. So that's an issue. Oklahoma State, I think I would right now, I think I would go Oklahoma State. 
because I like their depth. But again, is that bet thirty seven dollars? No bet thirty seven dollars. No. You still haven't given me my thirty seven dollars. By the way, I'm disappointed in that. No, I, I I don't think there's any huge favorite this year, but I could see them getting beat by the field. If you told me NAU versus the field, and I was setting lines in Vegas, the field would be the favorite. I think this year. I don't know. I don't think you've done enough research. No, I feel good about Nico, but everybody else, it's like, all right, I've seen good from them, and I've also seen mediocre from them. Fair enough. I mean, Drew Bosley's. I mean, you agree, well. right? Drew Bosley's. Yeah, but this is. You agree, though. This is not as big of a lock as it was last year, or the year before, right? Um, I no, I think it might be. I think after we watch. Most of the regular pretend season. Pretend you didn't see the George Kite Classic results. Just pretend the George Kite Classic didn't happen. I know that's a big influencer. That is a big influencer, to be honest. Uh, but yeah. yeah, I mean, they're not as like, it's not like NC State women are like the way they are going to be extremely dominant. There's definitely yeah. room for. Like, what? Let me pull these up. Where do you have? You got me talking about cross country now. This is crazy. I know. Uh, it's great. Hold on. Let me look at. Let me look at. Uh, what do you have there? So you have them going 3, 10, 20, 41, 42. So then you have their fifth guy at 70. Is that correct? Or is that their sixth guy? You're talking about Northern Arizona? Oh, that'd be their, their sixth, sixth guy. guy. Okay, so you have the six guy. Six guy is a fresh a freshman at 70. And yeah, then their seventh guy. Else. Seventh guy is 83. And then you have Ryan Raff, the greatest as a sophomore, who was the greatest runner in any history of 117. I, I mean, you know your old prognostications better than I do, but I felt like in the past it was like six guys in the top 30 in, in these preseason rankings for NAU. Was that not the case? Yeah. Oh, we'll see. I'm pretty confident they're going to win. We definitely are going to see. No, I think they're I, – I, again, I don't think anybody is a clear-cut favorite. If them versus the field, I would take the field, but everybody has issues. I mean, Stanford would be the one. Stanford would be the one because if you're saying you have three guys who can finish in the top four, it's just like, all right, can anybody step up? Just a little bit. Yeah. Just like a little bit. Can we get two more guys in the top 40 because then – it's a wrap. Hicks, Sprout, and Robinson. That's a really good. I'll go here. I'll say this. If Stanford does go one, two, four, they're winning the meet. I'll say that. If that actually happens, if your prediction comes true and they go one, two, four, Stanford will win the meet. Well, what I want to see is that, I want to see Stanford go one, two, three, and then get second. Cause I think that'd be really funny. Cause then it will introduce like, are we scoring cross country meets correctly? Because the visual of seeing a team go one, two, three, mm-hmm. and then get second would be like, wait. Because that's what happened to uh, American Fork at NXN. They had three, that Casey Klinger and two other guys that were like all-time greats in high school. And they had the best top three. But then the way you score a meet, that four or five being so far back, it didn't matter. And you could... Mm-hmm. You know, or having American really Fork good mediocrity that. was better than having three... Elite talent. So, anyway, we'll see. We'll talk about cross country more. Cross country show maybe coming yeah, back this week. We'll see. It is Labor Day, so I'm not working today. Just doing a podcast today, but we'll bring back cross country show at season two. Electric Boogaloo. Anyway, <laughs> all right. FlowTrackPodcast.gmail.com. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks to Colt for producing. As Gordon mentioned, we'll be back Wednesday, 9 a.m. Central, you can find the podcast archived on the site or wherever you listen to podcasts. And then we'll go live after the Diamond League final on Thursday, 3 p.m. Central time. That's the schedule for the rest of the week. Thanks, everybody, for listening and downloading. We'll talk to you on Wednesday.